Thank you so much for being here, Sunny. Hello, you're welcome. I'm sorry for the trouble. All right, so I'm going to talk today uh, about optimizing mental health through therapeutic lifestyle change. And I thought it would be good if I spoke, first of all, about how I came to be doing this work and writing about this and presenting about it. So maybe um, I'm going to say about six years ago, I was invited to speak at the Tibetan Medical Society in Dharamsala, India. His Holiness the Dalai Lama really is very committed to um, integrating uh, Eastern thought about mental health and wellness uh, and Western so that the two can be integrated and make use of each other's um, research and findings. So it was a big honor for me to be invited to present. And when you present there, they give you your topic. You don't get to choose it yourself. And the topic that was given to me was, let's see if I can say it, it's complicated. Disturbing factors in body, mind, life. Disturbing factors in body, mind, life. And so I was thinking, what in the world am I gonna talk about to an international cross-cultural audience so much of Western psychology is culture bound, of course, and I need it to apply to everyone. And then I thought about the work of Roger Walsh at the University of California at Irvine. And Roger had been introduced to me some years ago by my mentor, Angelus Arian. And Angelus had predicted that I was going to work with him in some way, which I didn't really understand because I'm a clinician and he's an academic. But I called Roger and I said, Roger, you have that website, Eight Ways to Wellbeing, for optimizing mental health. And there's a video there, there's all kinds of information. Would it be all right if I presented that uh, in Dharamsala? And he said, absolutely, Sonny, you go right ahead, take it and uh, go ahead. So I created um, a, a slide presentation, somewhat similar to what you're going to see today, using Roger's work and Roger's video. And I presented it in India and it was very well received. The questions that were asked were appropriate and um, I was able to elaborate in a good way. And on the way home, I was thinking about it and I was thinking, this is really such important work. It's fundamental to our work as therapists. And Roger, who is a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a full professor at the University Medical School, really talks in his work about how underutilized they are, that we get very um, uh, focused on diagnostics and uh, treatment plans and so forth, all of which is appropriate, but that this fundamental foundational um, work is oftentimes overlooked or just lightly, um, just lightly touched on. So I was on the way home and I was thinking, uh, it's nice that Roger has this website and all the information is there, but it really needs to be operationalized in some way. How can we make it more usable? And if I'm going to help make it more usable, who's the audience and how am I going to do that? Well, over the last 35 of my 40 years of practice, I've focused a great deal on chemical dependency, diagnosis and treatment. It's a large part of my private practice. It's people in recovery, uh, people newly in recovery, people in long-term recovery, or people who need to be in recovery and maybe just don't know it yet, or they kind of know it. So I thought about, well, you know, I'm, I think I should make a workbook out of this, uh, something that is, is highly usable, that you can hold in your hand, you can turn the pages, you can fold it back on, on itself so that you can, you can really use it with lots of charts and, you know, goal setting and so forth. And so I called Roger and I said, well, you know, I have this idea about how to put your research into really very practical, usable form. And he said, again, Sonny, you have the rights to all of it. Just go to it. Get the word out. Really just get the word out. So I'm going to talk to you today about Roger's research on optimizing mental health. And although he was talking about optimizing mental health for everyone, and what I'm going to talk about today is truly for everyone. This particular work that I'm talking about today is focused on people with issues of chemical dependency um, and other psychiatric issues. So that's where this came from and how it, how it happened that I came to be doing this work. As a side note, I'm going to tell you that two other workbooks are, are in the works right now and nearly completed. One for teen mental health. I think it's going to be called Eight Ways to Well-Being uh, to Sustainable 
well-being uh, for teens and families, and the other is going to be for the general public, eight ways to well-being for vitality. So today you're going to see eight ways to well-being for the recovering community. Pressing the wrong thing here to make it move forward. Hmm. There. So if you think about how our world has changed, um, not just with, I mean, COVID is a great example. That's what's currently happening. And it certainly is relevant to this presentation. I'll talk about that a little bit. But really and truly, our whole civilization has changed in the last hundred years. And our whole lifestyle has been profoundly altered. Most of us live walled off indoors. We work indoors. We pro pretty much live indoors. You know, unless you're working in agriculture, even, even that is highly industrialized. Or you're a construction worker out working outdoors. Most of us are working indoors. And we're also mostly living indoors. Uh, we're not in nature very much. We're under artificial light rather than in sunlight. We drive rather than we walk, so we're not getting the exercise that our ancestors got for sure. And um, especially here in the West, we're eating a lot of food that's not particularly nutritious. There's a lot of it. We certainly have lots and lots of food. But our soils are rather depleted and, um, you know, there's the issue of GMOs and the use of uh, fertilizers and pesticides that is... Um, seeped into our ground soil and into our water so that we're exposed to a lot of toxic elements that our ancestors were not particularly exposed to. And we're pretty darned busy. I sure am. And I, I have a feeling all of you that are listening are really busier than um, in the past. So if I think about for myself uh, uh, being a child, a little girl growing up, you know that we're not answering machines and there was not email or computers or all of that so that when my parents got done with their work day, whatever that was, you know, there was the whole late afternoon evening, um, pretty much of leisure. You know, after the dinner and the dishes were done, no dishwashers, they pursued hobbies or they listened to music or they played games or whatever. I think our modern lives are really not like that at all. And we're busy in the evening. A lot of us are working in the evening. So... It's easy for us to be in crowds, not right now with COVID, but typically, and, and still feel isolated and alone. And certainly now with COVID, where we're indoors even more than before, it can be pretty isolating. So we've definitely benefited from modern civilization, cars and dishwashers and you know computers for heaven's sakes, telephones, all these things that we enjoy, but we also suffer from it. So unhealthy lifestyle, and, and lifestyle has to do with what we eat, what we drink, our general lifestyle can either make us better or make us worse. And a lot of what passes for Western lifestyle, um, U.S. lifestyle, is making us worse. And uh, there's just no two ways about it. The, the data all supports that position. And all of us in the helping professions are dealing with psychological issues, maybe depression, maybe high anxiety and agitation, brain fog. I can't tell you the number of people that come to my office and just say, you know, I, I don't think I'm thinking very clearly. And these are certainly very bright people, but they feel foggy and um, with low level depression and a sense of hopelessness. We know that certain lifestyle choices increase the incidence of dementia and other um, diseases such as Parkinson's that have come from toxic exposure. Now, there hasn't been a lot of talk about toxic exposure, at least not, not in what I read in my journals. But my, I'm very aware of friends of mine who are Vietnam veterans who were sprayed with Agent Orange. Now they have Parkinson's disease and they have ALS and they have heart issues. So those are those men and women are a really good example of what happens with toxic exposure. So what about when we find out that, for example, I'm here in California, that all California wine has Roundup in it? What does that mean? If I drink wine, California wine, 
I'm drinking pesticide. So then what does that mean for our patients who have difficulty with alcoholism? And, you know, we, we are looking at um, how to help them stop drinking, certainly, but what have been the effects of the toxic exposure to the brain and to the body as a whole? And you can see the line on this slide that says, unhealthy lifestyle is a contributing factor in the encephalopathy and chemical dependency. That is really important to remember. It's a contributing factor in the encephalopathy and chemical dependency. So it affects the brain. And we know that addiction is surely a lifestyle disease. And I'm gonna talk about the various ways in which that is true. So there are many psychiatric issues that can be treated with lifestyle choices. And I tell my patients, you know, what I'm gonna prescribe for you is quite simple, but it is not easy. Um, it's actually challenging because our lifestyle is a set of habits that has to do with what we eat and how much exercise we get and what we consider to be fun, etc. So, Therapeutic lifestyle changes, as you can see here, I'm gonna go through the list, that can reduce psychological symptoms and suffering, definitely can reduce symptoms. More than relieving symptoms, they can make you happier, mentally clearer, intellectually sharper. Oh well, my goodness, who doesn't want that? I wanna be happier, I wanna be mentally clearer, and I wanna be intellectually sharper. They will increase your energy. Now we know that people who exercise regularly um, have increased energy. So again, um, it doesn't take it doesn't take much to realize that this is all true. It will enhance our performance and our sense of well-being. That sense of well-being is hard to describe and put into words, but we know it when we feel it. We have a sense of, of feeling good physically, feeling sharp mentally, feeling hopeful and able to take the next steps in whatever our the course of our life is. We know that lifestyle affects longevity, that people uh, who have healthy lifestyle tend to live longer, more productive lives. And it, uh, it's an anti-aging, it's an anti-aging thing. We have a, a good lifestyle, um, healthy health practices, and um, we look better and feel better later in life. Interestingly enough, the research says that a healthy lifestyle increases feelings of gratitude and an awareness of the natural world and ecology. Interestingly enough, here we are in this time of uh, desperation about climate change. And part of the reason for that, which I will hit on again uh, in my talk, has to do with being so disconnected from nature and the natural world. If we're never out in it, we don't have much, we don't feel much connection to it, even though certainly we are part of it. So I've just talked about the evidence that shows you that therapeutic lifestyle changes, I love it that Roger called them TLCs, therapeutic lifestyle change. Um, and if you remember, there was a lot of talk in the past about TLCs being tender loving care. Well, therapeutic lifestyle change is tender loving care for yourself and whoever else you live with and influence. You know, we influence the people we live with and the people we come in contact with. So when I sit down to, um, to a dinner, for example, with people who are eating well and mindfully, I'm influenced by that. I, I see it and I think, well, my goodness, if they can do it, perhaps I can too. So this is a, these are the fundamentals um, in terms of treating many, many psychological disorders and, and beyond really optimizing our mental health. It's one thing to treat um, a disease process, something that's causing us to not be healthy, mind and body, mind or and or body. But it's really important, I think, it is to me to be optimizing, to make better than what I am today in terms of my mental health and my physical health. So I ask you to think about how often it is that you talk to your patients, whether individually or, as, or in couples therapy, or if you're working with parents and children, or in groups, inpatient or outpatient, how often do you talk to them about therapeutic lifestyle? What, what, is, their, what is their nutrition like? What kind of food are they eating? 
Um, how often do they exercise? What is their what is their method of relaxation and stress reduction? And I'll go on about the eight ways altogether, but it's just an important question. How often are you asking about lifestyle in general? So <clears throat> there are many brain-based issues for chemically dependent people and those with other psychiatric ills. But I'm gonna say something for a moment here about chemically dependent people. Keith mentioned to you that I do brain mapping and I do a particular proprietary kind of brain mapping called Neurocodex. And when I do that map and the EEG that goes with it, I can often see something um, in my patients who have issues of addiction or have had, even for people who are in long-term recovery, where they have a poor tolerance for stress. I can see it in the brain, in the areas of the brain that have to do with poor tolerance for stress and overall resilience. And they have poor impulse control and poor judgment. I want you to think about that for a minute. Overall brain resilience means that we can tolerate the everyday stresses of life, whether they are small stresses or big stresses. And not only can we tolerate them, but we can bounce back from them. Now we know that some stresses obviously are much bigger than others. If I lose my job or if I'm getting a divorce or I'm forced to move, the birth of a child or a child going off to college, for example, those are all stresses and they're pretty big. And how can I um, integrate those and have the re resilience to bounce back, all right? Oftentimes our chemically dependent population of people do not have overall brain resilience. They're easily um, thrown off by ordinary stresses, never mind big stresses. And in addition to that, the area of their brain that has to do with impulse control is impaired. And so if you put those two things together, just those first two, the poor tolerance for stress, the overall lack of good resilience, combined with poor impulse control, it means exactly what you see in so many of your chemically dependent people, that the least little thing happens or a big thing happens, either one, the frustration of it, whatever, the impulse control is not there and what they want is relief. And so this is where relapse happens, right? <clears throat> In addition, if there's poor judgment and brain fog, um, you have a real mess on your hands and how are, we gonna how are we going to begin to fix all that? I think it's one of the reasons, these are, are reasons that treating alcoholism, drug addiction, is very, very challenging and difficult because it's so complex. And we have, to, we have to get a foundation under people so that they have better overall brain resilience, they can tolerate stresses that come with everyday life, and they have the impulse control that when they're very, very upset, they can settle themselves down. So what are these eight ways? I'm going to tell you what they are and then I'm gonna show you a film uh, and talk about the film for a minute. So the eight ways to well-being, and again, this comes from the research of Dr. Roger Walsh at University of California at Irvine. So he says, exercise, critically important. We know that from the research. I'm sure all of you know that we are meant to move and uh, that the more sedentary we are, the more likely we are to have health, mental and physical health problems. Adequate nutrition. So often our chemically dependent people have not had adequate nutrition. Maybe they prefer to drink rather than eat and so they truly have malnutrition or vitamin and mineral deficiencies that need to be addressed. And they need to be taught, we all need to be taught, what is proper nutrition anyway? There's so much conflicting information and it's highly politicized and it's hard to know. In addition, um, the research says that we need to have a means of relaxation and in my workbook, I focused on mindfulness because it's been proven to be so useful. But in Roger's work, he's just saying, in general, what do you do to relax? What do you do to just sort of um, quiet your mind, quiet your body, and de-stress? And that whatever it is, it needs to be done regularly every day. So mindfulness and meditation is a great way to do it. And there are other ways. Recreation is important. 
And I think I'll just go on and just say what they are and I'll elaborate on all of them later. So recreation, what do you do for fun? And how often do you get to do it? And what do you consider fun to be? Time in nature. Again, I, I spoke about how, how absent we are from nature oftentimes. And particularly during this pandemic, when we've been told to stay indoors, I think that nature deprivation has gotten worse. And certainly books are being written about children who are nature deprived and actually afraid to play outside. Relationship is a big one. And the research says that it's, it's not necessarily about one-on-one -on -one relationship, about, but about the abundance of our relationships and that we have regular human contact. Um, I worry especially about my patients and my friends who live alone because during this pandemic, when they're not really supposed to go out, it's more isolating and they have more isolation than is typical. Giving back, having an altruistic spirit, doing something for someone else or for others that you don't get paid to do. And lastly, but incredibly importantly, is spirituality to have a spiritual practice of some sort that may or may not be a religious practice. So those are the eight ways to well-being. And um, I'm going to show you a video in just a minute that was made for me. It was actually a gift to me. Uh, uh, a man who owns a treatment center came to me and said, I'm going to make a video about eight ways to well-being. And you don't have to pay for it and just make the video. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know anything about making videos or being a filmmaker or any of that. But my goodness, I've always wanted to be a movie star. That sounds fun. So maybe I'll get to be a movie star. And you'll see that for about, about five seconds, I do get to be. So this film was made for me and it was made using um, a film that was already in existence, most of it. And what I'd like you to do, if you will, I have critiqued it myself. I don't, I don't like all of it. There are things that I would do differently if I was planning it myself, but it was a gift and I'm grateful to have the gift. So I'm gonna click over to the screen that has the video and I'm gonna start it for you. It's about 13 minutes long. So I hope you will see what it is you like about it. There are things that I really like, uh, photographs that I really love, and then there's some things that I wish were there that aren't. So here we go. Recently, University of California at Irvine professor, Dr. Roger Walsh, published his exhaustive research into therapeutic lifestyle changes for optimizing mental health. He called it eight ways to well-being. Now, psychologist Dr. Sunny Whedon has converted this research into a workbook specifically formulated for recovering people who hope to achieve a fulfilling life of recovery and optimal mental and physical health. Eight ways to well-being for recovering people is the exciting result. A star represents these therapeutic lifestyle changes. Each point of the star represents one change you can make to improve your mental health. So let's look at what they are. The first point of the star is nutrition. Although our body will work hard to convert whatever is offered to it for fuel, research tells us that feeding ourselves wisely and well improves overall health and well being, promoting more stable moods lessening the experience of depression and anxiety, and preventing such serious illnesses as diabetes. Recovering people often have neglected their nutritional needs or they haven't known how to address them. Though nutritionists and dietitians may vary somewhat in their advice, it is well known that our best sources of good nutrition include a diet heavily weighted towards fresh, organic vegetables and fruits, and small amounts of clean sources of protein. It's important to avoid processed foods whenever possible, even though it can be a little more challenging. Let go of fast food altogether and embrace your local farmer's market. Cook for yourself and your family at home as much as possible. And read books and articles or watch programs that teach good nutritional principles and how to implement them. Try some new recipes and new foods and practice weekly meal cleaning for best results. 
Support your body's recovery by developing good eating habits and you will look better and feel better for sure. And remember, you quite literally are what you eat. The next point of the STAR is exercise. Psychiatrists and other mental health professionals have known for some time that exercise is a fabulous antidepressant and anti-anxiety prescription and often performs equally well as prescription medication for mood enhancement and stabilization. Exercise actually increases brain size and improves its function. It decreases the chances of disease and dementia. We are built to move and finding an acceptable means of daily exercise enhances our overall physical health and definitely enhances our sense of well-being. Don't forget to include exercises to improve your balance to prevent falls in the future. Any form of regular exercise for 20 minutes or more each day is a recipe for overall health. So get going and challenge yourself. The third point of the STAR is relaxation. Recovering people often suffer with higher than average levels of anxiety and other secondary mental health issues such as depression. Mindfulness meditation, practiced regularly, has been shown to be a powerful treatment for these issues. For those who are fortunate to not suffer any issues secondary to their addiction, mindfulness meditation and focused breath work are wonderful ways to allow the body to relax and rejuvenate. In the United States, we tend to be working longer hours and having less downtime, though it's well known that downtime actually allows us to be far more productive and creative in the long run. So develop a regular practice of relaxation. Use a phone app, a CD or DVD designed for this purpose to help you get started. Just 10 minutes of mindfulness meditation or focused breathing a day is a good start and then increase the time if possible. And as the saying goes, don't forget to stop and smell the roses. <music> Laughter is good medicine, and the next point of the star is recreation. Play is essential to recovery. Most recovering people have had their share of pain and disappointment to bear and are in need of a good laugh and a lightening of the energy around them. Humor offers real medical benefits as laughter can reduce stress and promote healing. Recreation is re-creation. When we have fun, our spirits are lifted and we can make room for creativity. Since many recovering people have forgotten how or never learned to have fun or explore an interest without drugs or alcohol, this is an essential area for exploration and healing. So what are you doing to be creative and have fun? Where do you like to go in your free time? What do you like to do that makes you smile? 
Do you have a hobby, something you look forward to doing in your spare time? It's never too late to try something new that might capture your enthusiasm. Explore the world around you and find interests that excite you. The main thing is for it to be a time out for you. So enjoy yourself and remember, fun is fundamental. The next point of our star is relationship, the human connection. Research indicates that the top of the chart of what makes for well-being and recovery, and for everyone actually, is relationships. When we have meaningful interactions with others, our brains actually resonate with one another, picking up subtle cues and helping us understand them and have empathy for them and vice versa. If you're a member of a 12-step fellowship, you're practicing the art of relationship every time you attend a meeting or work with a sponsor or sponsee. In addition, human interaction during our days is also a marker for health and longevity. Apparently because it strengthens our immune systems and guards against disease and depression. So make it a point to say hello to people on the street, in the grocery store, and at meetings. Offer a comment or a compliment if you can. If you are married or in a committed relationship, take the time to take a class or read about what it takes to create a healthy, long-term relationship. Relationship skills are learned. They don't just magically happen. Hallmark of recovery is change. And what is it that knows the most about change? Nature, of course. It's changing all the time. The sixth point of the star is time and nature. We resonate strongly when we spend time in the beauty of nature. And yet, our modern lives are mostly spent indoors in unnatural light and with little to remind us of a powerful truth. We are a part of nature and meant to coexist meaningfully with it and in it. Research shows that spending time in nature is healing and profoundly restoring it reduces heart rate and lowers blood pressure just by spending significant time in it. A life of recovery is a life of change about everything from our daily habits to our very identity. Since nature is always in the process of change, it has much to teach us about making these changes gracefully and without resistance. The seventh point of the star is giving back. An apt saying is, give of yourself to get for yourself. We don't live for ourselves alone. A life well lived means offering to others and to our community from our abundance of time, money, and personal gifts and talents. You may give back as a parent, a grandparent, a mentor, or a volunteer. You may sponsor others in a 12-step program or provide service at meetings. When we offer our service to others, we reap the rich reward of knowing that we have contributed to the world's work. Never believe that you have nothing to give or time to give. 
When we help others, it turns out that we help ourselves. Giving back is a great way to experience our own humanity and reap the rich rewards of the cheerful giver. And finally, our last and possibly most important point on the star is spirituality. Relationship to spirit and the divine doesn't require great buildings or temples, doctrines or religions. Recovering people know that a sense of spirituality is essential to their health and well-being. If you're part of a 12-step fellowship, you know that it is based in spiritual principles and emphasizes establishing a foundation of spiritual practice, including prayer and meditation. It's not sufficient to say with the wave of a hand, I'm spiritual but not religious. It requires a true practice that is regular and definable. When the second step in a 12-step program begins, we came to believe. It's up to us to determine what it is we believe. So long as it is an exploration and practice that emphasizes love, kindness, hope, forgiveness, and seeks the solace and comfort of the divine or higher power. Eight Ways to Well-Being for Recovering People is a call to action and a support system for those who have a stated intention to heal their bodies, minds, and spirits from the damage of addiction. If you follow these eight ways, making even small, sustainable changes to your lifestyle, you'll provide a foundation of health and well-being for life, which is typically free of charge and does not require medication or special circumstances. So what are you waiting for? So, um, that is the end of the film, and I hope you enjoyed it. It's available on YouTube. You, any of you are free to use it um, with your patients or with your groups. You just dial in Eight Ways to Wellbeing for Recovering People, and it will pop up. And um, maybe you caught the fact that Keith Arnold was uh, acknowledged in the acknowledgments. I was grateful to him for his support all these years. But I want you to think about that film um, as I have. I've watched it so many times now. And there are things I really like about it. Um, but I would like you to think about your critique. I'll tell you mine. <clears throat> I ask that there be diversity. I'm, I'm really committed to diversity in my work. Uh, and I wanted there to be diversity. And there is to a certain extent. Uh, we, used, we used stock footage and you'll notice that most of the people, not all, but most, are really young. Uh, it was filmed somewhat in the young adult program. And so I really wish that there were more people of varying ages uh, in that film. So that's a critique that I have. And I would like for there to have been even more diversity. So I'll be interested to hear in the uh, feedback session and any questions you have about what you saw that you would like to have different in that film. But um, I'm grateful that it got made and it was made as a gift to me, so that's wonderful. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of the eight ways. I'm going to start with this slide on nature. Nature is uh, certainly an underutilized aspect of optimizing mental health. I noticed that more and more inpatient treatment programs 
are taking people outdoors. Um, uh, I consulted a treatment program, a women's treatment program, where every day uh, the women go on little field trips to be outdoors. The other day they told me they were in the tide pools uh, down in Corona del Mar and hiking in a back bay area around an estuary where at that time the wildflowers were all out. And so there's, there's, um, a, there is a movement certainly in terms of eco-psychology and seeing that we need to get outdoors. We need the sunlight on our skin for vitamin D. Um, and we just need to be out in nature uh, in order to be weller and to raise our consciousness about environmental concerns that are that really should be at the top of all of our minds uh, in this day and age where we have such environmental degradation. The more we're outdoors, the more we put our hands in the soil to grow something or our bare feet to walk around on the grass or the soil, the better off we're going to be, truly. So probably by now all of you have heard about forest bathing. It's a concept that uh, originated in Japan. But the research does indicate that if you walk for 90 minutes in nature, um, the Japanese and the forest bathing would say in a forest, it will decrease your, um, your heart rate, lower your heart rate, um, increase, uh, decrease depression, decrease anxiety. And um, I was talking with a friend recently who's involved in building a large wellness center, very large wellness center in Southern California. And he said they're act they actually have devoted uh, quite a few acres of land to building a forest that will be specifically for forest bathing. I thought that was fascinating. The urban planners are beginning to think about um, time in nature uh, for people as an aspect of wellness. Some years ago, I spoke with Majora Carter, and uh, Majora won a MacArthur Award for her work in the world, uh, which was originally called Greening the Ghetto. And she had read research, I believe it came out of the University of Chicago, that said, where there are more trees, there is less crime. Fascinating. Where there are more trees, there is less crime. Now, most of us are living in urban or suburban areas, this slide says 50% of the world's population are city dwellers. Um, here in the States, it's far more. We don't, we don't have large rural populations. But it's also been predicted that it, in a few decades, it'll be 70% of the world's population. So urbanization and the disconnection from nature have grown. It's interesting to me, and I think it connects to Majora's work, that it is a fact that people born and raised in cities are more likely to develop schizophrenia. I don't know, and I don't know if anybody knows the exact reasons why, but I think it probably relates to toxic exposure, you know, from car exhaust and um, general uh, quality of air and water, things that most of us don't have a lot of control over. We can't really control the air we breathe, other than by um, voting for supporting clean air uh, reforms and laws. So it stands to reason that if we're in major cities where there's a lot of pollution, we're, we're getting toxic exposure without even realizing it. So it's really important to go out into natural areas and spend time in nature. Nutrition. Oh my goodness, this is such a big um, category. Feel better by changing your diet. We all know this, it's just very difficult to do uh, for most of us. So the slide says for most of human history, finding enough food on a daily basis was a big concern. And believe me, people got a lot of exercise just rummaging around looking for food um, out in the area and wherever they lived. However, as I said earlier, our problem today is typically too much food. And if you travel around in the United States, um, and are out and about, what you see is massive obesity. I forget the exact statistic, but I think it's something like 63% of Americans are not just overweight, but in the obese category, if you look at their um, BMI. And of course, diabetes is just rampant because it's connected to the high rate of obesity and overweight. So talking to our clients about their diets is extremely important. 
Usually I will start by asking my clients to watch the Netflix movie, Food, Inc. Um, and these things tend to get, become highly political and I don't like to get into the political aspects of it, but it's really important for them to understand that much of our food supply um, is, far, is, is not farmed by a little farmer nearby. Uh, but in big agribusiness. And it's better for us to go to the local farmer's market, buy food that's been, that we can um, shake hands with the farmer um, and know that it's been organically grown in, in soil that has not been depleted. So it's, it's a tall order. And this area of nutrition um, we could talk about for a very long time because it's, it's a big one. But I definitely always take a nutritional history from my clients. I ask them to tell me, what did you have for breakfast today? What do you typically have for breakfast? How much protein do you get? Um, what do you have for lunch? What do you have for dinner? Um, can I talk you into stopping altogether eating fast food, which is high in calories, low in price, um, easily obtained, but but very, very poor nu nutritionally. So I will start by, you know, taking a little um, inventory with them about that. And I'll tell you that I recently um, worked with a man who was referred to me for his alcoholism, and he had failed 17 treatment programs. That's huge, 17 treatment programs. And I said to him, so John, what do you have, what did you have for breakfast? He said, oh, I don't really like to eat breakfast, but if I do, I just love gummy worms. Well, my dear friends, what are gummy worms? They're just sugar and um, probably also all other awful things I don't want to think about. So we started, it seems so simple, but for him it was not simple. We started with, okay, John, could you eat a half of a banana with a little bit of peanut butter on it? And gradually, 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 it has taken almost a year to change his diet and to have his diet um, improve. And guess what? He's being able to maintain his sobriety differently than ever in the past. He looks better, he feels better, um, and he's able to volunteer and do a lot of other things in the community, um, take singing lessons and all kinds of things that he's not been able to do before. And I think of it, a lot of it had to do with correcting the nutritional deficiencies. So I encourage you to ask your clients, if you don't already, about their diet and help them to create a diet that is healthy, uh, get, get a dietitian or a nutritionist involved if you think that's necessary. Exercise. I mean, there's so darn much written about exercise these days, I hardly need to even talk about it for you to know how important it is. But again, it's a lifestyle choice, a therapeutic lifestyle change. Um, for me, it actually is the hardest one. I didn't grow up with a lot of exercise in my family. And so I am resistant, resistant. And then, you know, comes the Krebs cycle, where the more you don't do something, the more you don't do something. But you know, the Krebs cycle can go the other way too. The more you do do something, the more you do do something. So having, talking to our clients about their exercise program, how much exercise do they get? and helping them to understand that they are benefiting their brain as well as their body when they are exercising, they're getting proper blood flow, they're getting more oxygen to their brain, et cetera, and making sure they're getting out and about. Maybe they're exercising indoors, that's fine. Um, outdoors, if they're exercising outdoors, guess what? They get the exercise and they get the time in nature, so it's a good thing. So I talked to them about exercise. Relaxation. It's challenging in the busyness of our lives. And again, I said to you earlier that in my workbook, I talked a lot about mindfulness. And many treatment organizations and many therapists are not now teaching mindfulness meditation as a part of general treatment, as a part of their treatment plan. So it's important, even if the person says, oh, no, 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 I, I don't feel stressed, to introduce them to stress to stress reduction and mindfulness anyway, and ask them to begin keeping a log of how much time each day they're actually spending quieting themselves, closing their eyes in silence, and taking a break. 
just taking a break, quieting their mind. Um, it can be difficult. And I teach four different kinds of meditation, sitting, walking, lying, <laughs> and standing. Depending on the person and the particular diagnostic issues or what kind of meditation they have difficulty with, if they, if they can't sit, then I'll prescribe walking. Um, if they need strengthening, you know, just overall strengthening, I'll prescribe a standing meditation. And I teach them. I do it right along with them in my office. And, of course, nowadays by Zoom, I'll, I'll do the meditation with them so that they're really learning. And we can start each session with just five minutes so that they're getting into the habit and getting the idea of what it means. I show them if they have an iPhone or a smartphone, I show them some apps that they can put on their phone and uh, do easily on their own. Now, I also make the point that meditation, mindfulness, is not the only way to do relaxation. It could be reading. I know that's one that I really like to sort of lose myself in uh, reading. Um, but I want to hear from them. What do they do to relax and to unwind? And how much time do they spend doing it? Giving back, having an altruistic spirit. Um, I think the, the film showed so well that the community benefits when we are altruistic and do something to give back. But I also make the point with my patients, sometimes we have these grandiose ideas about how we have to do some world-changing uh, thing in order for it to count, and I say, no, um, giving back can mean calling someone who needs phone calls. It can be making some muffins and taking them to your neighbor. It doesn't have to be some huge uh, monumental thing. It can be small things, but um, an idea of service, being of service. Certainly 12-step programs emphasize the idea of being of service, but why, why should we do it? What is the benefit to mental health? Well, there's the idea of building self-esteem. If I believe that I have something to give, it increases my sense of self, my sense of self-esteem, and my self-respect. And it also increases my respect for other people and my awareness of the needs of other people. So giving back as a practice can lead to more empathy. It's really very important uh, for the individual in terms of affecting other other. Um, aspects of well-being, particularly relationship, which I'm going to talk about right now. So relationships are an essential, essential element of a happy life. And um, neuroscience has certainly proven that we're hardwired for empathy and intimacy. It doesn't mean that we know how to do it. Now, Roger Walsh's research says that we need human contact and plenty of it. So it's not just about one-on-one -on -one relationship where you're my friend or you're my, my partner or my colleague. It's also just general human contact. And particularly, as I said earlier in this time of COVID, it's important for us to um, maintain our human relationships. Uh, it's not quite the same on Zoom or on other platforms, but it, it's it's something. And so I can meet with my friends on Zoom and have a conversation, and we can share what's going on in our lives and laugh and talk together. And when the male person comes, I can say hi to her. <laughs> you know, it's more human contact. It's really important. So in terms of intimacy and empathy, I think the best places to learn those two qualities are in group therapy. I've always believed that our best healing takes place in community. And so if you're a person um, working in inpatient uh, settings and you're doing a lot of group therapy, it's a great place for people to learn more about how to be empathic and how to have intimate conversations. Um, so often people think that an intimate conversation only takes place between partners or close, close friends. But you can have an intimate conversation with a wide variety of people. And empathy is something that is partly developmental and partly learned. And so if our clients have not learned how to have empathic and intimate relationships, it's our job to teach them. And uh, it's just part of our it's just part of our work. And certainly with the work of recovery, 
where people either are very isolated in their drinking and using, or oftentimes they're used to having very superficial relationships, but they don't really know how to have more intimate relationships where there's a lot of sharing and a lot of vulnerability uh, that is respected um, and appreciated. So I encourage you to help your clients have better relationships and to talk to them about the relationships they do have and help them sort those out and improve them as best they can. Recreation. This is a big area. It seems so simple. Um, and maybe, maybe for a person who doesn't have uh, mental health or chemical dependency issues, it is an easy one. But for our chemically dependent patients, this can be very, very difficult. What do you do for fun? And if your fun has been drinking at the bar with friends, uh, getting high and going to concerts, where everything that you do for so-called fun is connected to chemicals of one sort or another, then as therapists, we really need to talk to our clients about, all right, we have to find new ways to have fun. And what are those going to be? It's certainly an area where hobbies uh, are, can be talked about. And so many of my chemically dependent patients really do not have hobbies. If I say, what do you do for fun? Other than uh, drinking or getting high, they really can't tell me. So it's definitely a large area to be explored and to say, okay, well, let me make some suggestions to you. And you're gonna find out if you like my suggestion or you don't like my suggestion. And either way, you're gonna to add to your experience base. But we're gonna try out some new ways of having fun and finding people to have fun with. So I encourage you to ask about that. What do you do for fun and what equals fun for you? Spirituality. So the research says that people who attend religious services once a week live seven years longer than those who do not. Very interesting statistic. And um, although I'm certainly not suggesting that everybody has to be religious, I'm certainly not saying that. I think that um, standard traditional religions have provided uh, a sense of community that has disappeared from so much of our modern life. And there's very little community around and um, churches and temples and uh, places of religious practice do offer a sense of community and a sense of belonging. They uh, provide ceremony and you know, ceremony touches us so deeply that it's important to have ceremony in our lives of some sort. So I know with my own, uh, with my own clients, I will ask them about their spiritual connection. Where in their life do they feel the divine? And if they have a religious practice, if they belong to a religious organization of some kind, I check to make sure, is this, is this organization one that promotes kindness and compassion and forgiveness, those kinds of um, positive things? Or is there a lot of condemnation and um, fear? And I try to, to steer them to the former rather than the latter. If they don't belong to a formal religious organization, I ask them um, if they have a particular spiritual practice that they adhere to. Maybe they are longtime meditators or, you know, whatever it might be. And if they have nothing, you know, no, I, I don't really even know what that means. I try to begin with a few suggestions. Um, certainly, 12-step programs provide a lot of reading. There's, there are lots of readings um, and uh, books that have spiritually inclined readings in them that they that for purchase. But I will, I will help them to understand about affirmations and how they can make affirmations. Um, I might suggest that they attend a religious service of some sort of their choosing and see if it speaks to them in some way. I try to help them establish a spiritual practice because it really and truly is part of the eight ways to well-being um, that lead to overall mental health and physical health. So that's the eight ways. You've heard all of them. I would like to hear your questions or your comments, anything that you have to say about any of this. Um, this last slide says, 
that at any given time, a billion people worldwide are suffering from a mental health issue. That means that here in the US alone, 60 million people have a mental health issue. And we know that one in five women in the United States over the age of 20 is taking an antidepressant. That is outrageous. That's, that's a shame. And that there are over, now over 30,000 suicides per year in the US. And we know, as Keith said in the introduction, that these numbers are going up during, during the COVID pandemic. And we as mental health professionals are being asked to do something. And so um, I hope that what I've said today will help you to add to your um, experience base of things that you can do to help your clients at this particular time. So therapeutic lifestyle change can prevent and treat so many psychological disorders, anxiety, depression, chemical dependency, age-related cognitive losses. They enhance our overall well-being, and they are, this is important, they can be, can be just as powerful as drugs for preventing, treating some mental health disorders, enhancing well-being. I do want to say about that, of course, I'm a psychologist, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't ever interfere in what medical doctors are doing with regard to medication. I do tell people that if you will change your lifestyle in these ways, it's quite possible that many of your symptoms are going to remit. Lastly, I want to tell you that the Eight Ways Workbook is available on my website, drsunnyweedon.com. You can buy it on my website. You can buy it on Amazon. It's available. But there are two differences that I want to make clear. If you buy from Amazon, you get a cloth-bound copy. If you buy it from me directly, it's a wiro bind because I like the wiro bind. I wanted to be able to have it folded back on itself and there is automatically lots of space for writing. So that would be the difference. Um, this workbook is used currently in a number of inpatient treatment settings where it's core curriculum. And if you're in an inpatient setting where you do group therapy or outpatient for that matter, it's set up in such a way that it's a rolling curriculum. If the group happens to be working on time and nature and you have two new people come in, well, after they read the introductory material, that's where they start. They start with time and nature and move on. If they're only with you for a brief period of time, let's say 30 days, they take the workbook with them and they continue working on it on their own. I have other people, other therapists who say, I just have my, my patients do this routinely and I just check in with them. They do it largely on their own, but I check in with them on a weekly basis to say, where are you and how you're doing? And then lastly, I had a woman call me and say, you know, I've taken my sponsee through the 12 steps many, many times. And I think it's time um, to do something in addition. So I, myself, and my sponsee are going to do this workbook together. So the feedback's been great. It makes me happy to know that. And I pass that information on to Roger. And he says, yes, I mean, just keep getting it out there in the world. So there you are. Um, now I want to hear from you. Thank you, Sonny. That was great. And a special hello to Michelle.